a short introduction about me. So I'm a core developer at Party Technologies, uh, and I work on Ethereum and Ethereum 2.0. Uh, so uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, backward compatibility. Uh, so in different contexts, we have different uh, definitions for backward compatibility. For example, in the context of uh, system interface, it's mostly about uh, interop with an older version uh, of the interface and also for things that handle files and objects uh, it's about uh, handling those things uh, produced by older versions uh, so we're talking about backward compatibility in a blockchain context so we are really talking about smart con smart contracts uh, and the, the definition here i give is if a smart contract works in the past uh, then it should continue to work uh, in the future, no matter how many uh, feature upgrades we add. So uh, the thing we talk about here today is uh, that is the not so nice story about backward compatibility in C Ethereum. So uh, backward compatibility can be really easy to be broken uh, for a lot of times, uh, unintentionally or intentionally, as we, we demonstrated on Ethereum. Uh, so. This is a huge issue because uh, real on-chain contracts are affected and also a lot of real money are involved. Uh, for unintentional backward calibre breakage, we have the example of EIP-1283, uh, which is a change to decrease gas cost. But unfortunately, uh, we find that if we do that, then there are some issues with uh, backward because it can cause some contracts to have re-entry attacks. And we also have 884 in Istanbul, uh, which is a EIP to increase gas cost. We also figure out this can break backward compatibility uh, uh, because it can just cause some functions of some contract to be frozen. Uh, so those unintentional backward compatibility breakage are nearly uh, missed in the whole EIP auditing process. We nearly found it uh, for the last minutes, and it caused some a lot of issues. Uh, so in the past, we also had debate about whether increasing gas codes or decreasing gas codes would be better. And it turns out both scenarios can break backward compatibility. So it's the same bad thing. And in the future, we may also have uh, intentional backward compatibility breakage. So for example, if now we know that gas codes break everything, so in the future, we might just go ahead with some, some gas code changes if that's really pressing and we want to reflect the real computation, computation cost. Uh, and also the example for state rent, uh, which is a, a and I don't know whether we want to adopt it now, but we probably want to have some similar proposals to fix state bloat, uh, which can also break backward compatibility. And we also have the ETH 1.x uh, to ETH 2.0 shard. Uh, in that case, some contracts can be broken as well. Uh, so this comes to a conversioning. Uh, it's really about that we currently don't have really guard for a backward LB that is so easy to be broken, so we probably want to do something with it. Uh, so in this section, I'm going to talk about uh, three different versions uh, of account versioning uh, from code prefix to uh, special contracts to RLP field. Uh, just give you an idea about how this involves and uh, the thing we finally settled on. Uh, so the earliest is probably the code prefix, which was in uh, EIP 154 uh, in 2016. So it did it is discussed in the context of it in EWASM support in Ethereum. So uh, the, the idea is quite simple. We just add a add a small code prefix in every contract, and if if the contract detects that uh, that prefix, then we just uh, execute using that version instead of the, the default version. Uh, so this is later expanded into EIP 7007. Uh, so we did have some issues. So with code prefix alone, uh, the issue is that some uh, we can deploy data on chain currently. So some data might just accidentally have the prefix, uh, than the than what is the code on chain. So 
Uh, this is a huge issue for VMs that requires validation. Uh, so it's just really bad. And uh, we can do something about this. So there's a way that we can just disallow and use uh, opcode deployments uh, so that we don't have those uh, data on chain that accidentally have the prefix. Uh, but the issue is that it's not backward compatible. So uh, the second uh, variations we had was uh, using a kind of turning where special contracts. Uh, so this was EIP 8091 in 2019. Uh, so basically the idea is quite simple. We just store the version uh, information of an account in a special contract that is uh, uh, stored in a lower location. Uh, and then whenever we execute a contract, we just uh, fetch the version from that special contract first and then decide which VM we use. Uh, so this is quite simple. It does not require any change to state. Uh, the issue, however, is that we need an additional tree operation, uh, which is uh, kind of bad because, uh, I mean, each uh, tree operation for all the account uh, is uh, means we double the tree access and uh, even the current tree access is not really fast so that's a, that's an issue and let, uh, finally we have the uh, conversion in VRLP field so uh, this was originally in CIP 1014 in 2017 uh, the idea is quite simple also quite simple so we have four uh, LP encoding currently nonce balance or root code hash we just add another one version and we will use that to determine the VM we use. Uh, so later it is expanded into uh, 7002. Uh, and uh, this is actually quite robust and entirely backward compatible. Uh, so uh, this is also strongly favored by the 615 team. Uh, during the Istanbul discussion, uh, we had less code change than expected, so now guest and uh, party and I believe another plan, uh, uh, ARETH all, uh, all have uh, a PR open for, for this uh, conversioning uh, uh, implementation. Uh, it's also slightly good for the storage proposal because now you can use this version field to determine, uh, determine what the rest of the RRQ field that storage might act uh, means. So it's, it provides some semantics for them. And it's the current selected account versioning solution. Uh, so for completeness, there's also one thing we need to talk about is about if using this version, uh, then how, what is the version, the child contracts that created by parent contracts. Uh, so in EIP 7002, this is what called a contract family. And later we can, uh, this contract family can be extended. So we can have some extensions to EIP 7002 that uh, allows different uh, conversions to be created. Uh, but this, this is for completeness, so you can release this uh, if you want. And then we have the versionless EVM. Uh, so what we are talking about here is really, uh, if we only have a conversioning, the issue is every six months we will want to deploy a new version. Uh, that for some teams is not substantial. So that, that is a huge pushback uh, during the Istanbul hard fork discussion. Some people just think uh, a conversion is good, but if we need to maintain too many uh, conversions, then uh, that is a huge maintenance cost and they may not want to do that. Uh, so versionless EVM is a uh, fix to try to address that. Uh, so what we do is we design, just design things with forward compatibility in mind. Uh, and we remove some offenders uh, that breaks by quality in the EVM. Uh, so in the end, we just have one new version. So the, the current uh, EVM version will be the legacy version. And we just have one more version, which is a versionless EVM. And we can add new features, change gas codes on that new version. Uh, so talking about uh, like uh, general things about interface design, there's something really important, it's called Hurm's law. It basically states that if you have a su sufficient number of users, then it really doesn't matter what you promise uh, in the API. Like all the ob observable behaviors in your system uh, will be used by someone. So, uh, so we definitely have sufficient 
a number of users, so Hiram's law definitely applies to us. And uh, I mean, during the backward recovery discussion, many people, many core developers were talking about the promise of EVM, uh, of Ethereum and EVM. Uh, the issue is that there will be someone who uh, that don't follow the, the promise. Or if something is best practice in the past, it may not be best practice in the future. Uh, so what I'm saying here is that instead of doing all the social promising, maybe you can just use some social engineering uh, techniques to fix those issues. So the fix is quite simple. We just remove all those uh, observer behavior that we don't want smart contracts to absorb. Uh, so the biggest offender is basically gas cost. So we actually, uh, I mean, a lot of core developers has expressed that smart contracts shouldn't make any assumptions about gas cost because gas cost can change a lot. And so we just remove any observer, observer behavior within the EVM about gas cost. Uh, in detail, it's basically removing the gas of code and for call, call code, delegate call, we just take it, take the full guess. And if any call stack is out of guess, then we just uh, revert all of the call stacks. Uh, the third item is because we don't want to accidentally reveal uh, the current guess life information uh, for unapparent contracts if a child contract succeeds or fails. Uh, so we also deny any unused of codes to be deployed. Uh, so this is basically idea, adding an extremely simple uh, validation process during contract deployment. So uh, in this case, we can make future upgrades that add additional upcodes much more safer. So there are extra goodies. For example, we can have a hash feature prop, uh, which makes some contract can be pre-deployed on, on chain uh, that can later take advantage of new feature upgrades. So using a conversioning and versionless EVM, we actually have a pretty robust uh, backward compatible solutions for Ethereum. Uh, so using this, uh, we now can freely change gas cost uh, because it's now an unobservable behavior and no contracts can depend on it uh, in the versionless EVM version. Uh, we can also freely add new of course uh, because now it is now the deployment of unused of codes, uh, so the conflicts will not be an issue anymore. And for things like state rent, uh, it still removes contracts from the state, but uh, for all the rest of the parts, the state execution, they can be backward compatible. Uh, it's not, uh, the upgrade will, will not be like totally hassle-free. Uh, there are something we need to care about. Uh, for example, uh, we need to change the Solidity compiler a little bit uh, so that uh, we can uh, use, because Solidity compiler actually makes some assumptions about guys' codes and we need to uh, make the compiler not make that, those assumptions anymore. Uh, the second issue is uh, emergency hard work, which I guess probably nobody can do anything about it. If there's really a, a denial service attack on Ethereum, then backward recovery has to be broken because those attack contracts cannot uh, exist on chain. And the sixth thing is something extra, is the uh, UVM boundary. Uh, so in this section, we're basically talking about uh, what upgrades will break and what will never break has never been really be communicated clearly. Uh, so the, the thing is, no matter how we communicate it, uh, the rule is quite complex currently. Like we need to make assumption, make some assumption, and not pick, make other assumptions. And the the, the, the distinction between them is, is not that obvious. Uh, and many uh, smart contract developers and even call call developers misunderstood them. So uh, this section is basically an actual purpose that we may want to have a really clear boundary design. Uh, for backward quality about what we can change in VM and what we cannot change. So uh, all the contract developer knows that uh, for each contract, we have code, we have uh, the related storage, and also each contract can access extra contracts uh, and pre-compiles. So this is a clear distinction. So what we can do is we just say, 
uh, that the code and the corresponding story will never change, but we allow change of anything that is in the in the state, like external contracts or external free compiles. Uh, so this basically gives us a boundary. And what we need to do right now is basically build on top of the versionless EVM and then move those of code that we might want to change in the future into a pre-compile. For, so for example, this basically is uh, balance uh, those state access of codes and some of codes that requires uh, block information. So we just provide the pre-compile to access those information. So we can have a better design uh, to communicate the backward compatibility model. And in that case, uh, things like state grant or the migration from ETH 1.x to 2.0 uh, can be much more clearly communicated and it would cause more, much less uh, surprise for contract developers. Uh, so uh, in this talk, uh, this is conclusion. So basically we are talking about uh, a uh, nearly complete, complete fix for our current backward calculated model uh, that consists of a conversioning, uh, which allows smart contracts uh, not to be affected by new versions. Uh, and we also have the versionless EVM design, uh, which enables forward compatibility. Uh, I believe those two combined can provide a really good and robust backward calculated model for us currently. And there's also uh, a proposal that we, in the future, we might want to do some additional change to also design the EVM for better programming and uh, model communication. So we define a really clear EVM model about what we can change and what we uh, definitely won't change. Uh, so it becomes harder uh, to misuse uh, those things. And that's all. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me after the, the talk. So thank you.